Let Badagri say Amen. I welcome everyone tonight in Jesus' name. It's a special day in Badagri. I said it's a special day in Badagri. Tonight is our normal leadership development program. And so tonight, we're going to have the first part, which is for our leaders all over the nation, in Nigeria, and all over Africa. So we're taking Badagri to the rest of the world. So after that session for the workers, for the leaders, then I come to our good people. Tonight something will happen to you. You will never be the same again in Jesus' name. But please play at, pay attention even during the leadership message because God has something for everyone. If you believe that, give me a good but that great amen. Raise those hands to the Lord. Let the Lord anoint those hands. Father, in Jesus' name, we well, thank you for the great privilege you have given us tonight. Thank you for your people here. Thank you for the church here. Thank you for our leaders and workers, men and women. Thank you for every section of the world. And thank you because this work is growing and prospering in our hands. It will continue to prosper. We bless your name for all our members and all our invitees who are here tonight. I pray that you'll open the doors of heaven. Shower your blessings upon everyone in Jesus' name. Turn every life around. We'll never be the same again. I pray that you'll fulfill your word and let there be great manifestation of miracle in every life tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. Tonight we're coming to consider for the leaders something very special. And I'm starting from Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 9. Genesis chapter 3 verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? That question means, where are you? We come to Genesis chapter 4, verse 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? Another question, where is your brother? In Genesis chapter 18, verse 9, Genesis chapter 18, verse 9, they said unto him, Why is Sarah thy wife? Where's your wife? In Exodus chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 20, Exodus chapter 2. We're reading from verse 20. And he said unto his daughters, Where is he? Where is the man? Why is it that she have left the man calling, that she may eat bread? We'll come to the New Testament, Luke chapter 17, verse 17. Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Tonight we are considering these questions. And we are going to concentrate on the question in Luke chapter 17, verse 17. The message tonight is answering the great unanswered question. That's the question in your life. That needs to be answered. There's a question in your family that needs to be answered. There's a question in your profession 
that needs to be answered. There is something rolling about in your mind. There is something that you'll be wondering about. An unresolved matter. A great question. A question that comes from heaven. A question that comes from earth. A question that comes from your neighborhood. An unanswered question. And until that question is answered, life will not be what it thought to be. That's why you came here tonight. That as a leader, as a preacher, as a pastor, as a father, as a mother, as a member of the family, this great unanswered question or resolved problems must be answered in your life. That's why we came here tonight answering the great unanswered question. These questions I've read to you now came and they still come. These questions came to individuals and they will keep coming until the end of time. These questions demand answers, a correct answer, a convincing answer, a truthful answer, an honest answer, a practical answer, a verifiable answer. It's not just to give an answer. We must be able to verify the answer you are giving. Where art thou? Where are you? In the garden, but out of grace. Where are you? In Eden, but not having eternal life. Where are you? In the church, but not in Christ. Where are you? In religion, but not in righteousness. The next question is, where is Abel, your brother? Where is your brother? Where is your sister? Have you ever thought about that? Think about that now. What's his name? Cain's brother was Abel. What's the name of your brother? When last did you contact him? When last did you touch him? What's the name of your sister? Where is your sister? Where is your wife? Where is your husband? Where is your son today? Where is your daughter today? Look at that neighbor. Where is your neighbor? Where is he spiritually? Where is she professionally? Where is he in the family? Where is he in the line of progress that the Lord assigned for him, for her? Are they alive or dead? Cain, where is Abel? Is he alive or dead? And I'm asking you tonight, where is your brother? Have you killed him by the sword or by your words? Is he living in Christ? Is he dead in sins and trespasses? The question that came to Sarah, or for Sarah, talking to Abraham, these visitors have come from heaven. And then they were asking before they went, because it was to be a day that 25 years of barrenness will be rolled away in Abraham's life. And I can tell you tonight, 20 years of problem, 30 years of problem, 40 years of problem, long-standing mountains will be rolled away in your life and family. But is she around? Is he around? Where is your wife? In the tent or outside your tent? Where is your wife? Together? Or separated. Where is your wife? Devoted and loving or divorced and lost. Because there's no child in the family. Because all these 20, 23, 24 years, we've been expecting Isaac, the child called laughter. And there's no laughter in the family, only tears and sorrow. 
Have you divorced her? Have you sent her away? Have you separated from her? Where is Sarah, thy wife? Where is she today? Where? And now, in Exodus, there was a man. He was to be the deliverer of a whole nation. And these ladies had left him at the side of the well. One of them, little did she know that this man will be invited home to them and this man eventually will become our husband. But they let her, him outside and the father asked, where is he? Where is the man? Where is your man? Tonight, bone of your bone, the Lord will give to you. Flesh of your flesh, the Lord will give to you. Where is he? Why have you left him outside there? And now we come to the New Testament. Where are the nine? Where are the nine? This is the story we're going to look at very closely with the leaders tonight. Look at this. Luke chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 11. And it came to pass that as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee, Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him, how many lepers there? Ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And he lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass, it will come to pass tonight. Somebody there said it's coming to pass tonight. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw what, that he was healed, he turned back. And with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Where are they, were they not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? But where are the nine? There are not found that returned to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. Thy faith has made thee whole. I thought but that great will say, Amen. Answering the great unanswered question, where are the nine. As we look at the story, there are three things we are considering. Number one, the graciousness of our noble Savior. The graciousness of our noble Savior. Point number two, the gratitude of a native Samaritan. Native Samaritan. The gratitude of a native Samaritan. Number three, the guilt of nine silent superiors. They were superior to the Samaritan. They were Jewish people. They knew more than the Samaritans. They were the sons of Abraham. And yet, the nine, these nine superior people, they were silent. And the Lord was asking, where are they? Have not ten people been healed, cleansed, made whole, cured? Only this stranger came. Where are the nine? The guilt of nine silent superiors. Number one. Tell me number one there. The graciousness of our noble Savior. As you look at the story, look at it from verse 11 and see how gracious the Lord is. And the Lord is gracious to everyone. 
His grace covers everyone. His grace is sufficient for everyone. And today, His grace will come to you. No matter how far you have gone, the grace of God will reach you. No matter how weak you are, the grace of God will reach you. And no matter, you might even be coming from afar. And you raise up your voice and you're not even coming near the Lord. Where you are, no matter how far, this grace of God will flow into your life tonight in Jesus' name. And it came to pass as they went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Samaria, you see those Samaritans, they had nothing to do with the Jewish people. They kept them at a distance. Don't come near me. You're dirty. Don't come near me. You're syncretic. Don't come near me. You're not good enough. But these lepers, these lepers, these lepers from Samaria and the lepers from Galilee, a leper is Samaritan, and then the nine of them, they were Jewish people. They were united in their problem. United in their suffering, united in their sickness, united in their disease. And the disease brought them together. You know, there are some people, they won't allow the word of God to bring us together. But these lepers, look at what brought them together. The disease brought them together. If the disease and the sickness and the suffering could bring them together, we shall allow Christ to bring us together. We shall allow the scriptures to bring us together. We shall allow the love of God to bring us together. And then he tells us in verse, we're looking at verse 12. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. These lepers, they united together afar off. You know why? They were all outcasts. They were all pushed away. And since they were outside, outside the kingdom, outside Jerusalem, outside the acceptable people, outside the civilized people, outside the people that were reckoned with, they said, if we isolate ourselves already, they have cast us out. Therefore, the only thing is for us to be united together. And if you think about that, as you come tonight, you're not going to have a contrary view. If you think about that, you're not going to have a contrary disposition. You say, here we are, the devil does not like us. Here we are, the demons do not like us. Here we are, the simple society does not like us. Here we are, religious people do not like us. Here we are, traditional people do not like us. If we're divided among ourselves, we're hurting ourselves. No, we're not going to be divided. We're going to remain united. I said we're going to remain united. We came here for that purpose. And Jesus Christ is the single personality that unites us together. And all of them had one voice. And they cried out and they said, Master, Jesus, have mercy on us. In prayer, they were united. In supplication, they were united. In expectation, they were united. In holding on to the promise of God, they were united. And Jesus Christ responded to them. The Lord will respond to you tonight in Jesus' name. And then he tells us, the stood afar off. Why would they stand afar off? Because they were unclean. Why would they stand afar off? Because they were defiled. I'm looking at Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 13. Leaders, workers, open your Bible. We're looking at Leviticus chapter 13. And I'm reading from verse 45. Chapter 13 from verse 45. It tells us in verse 45. And the leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent. And he said, Bear, and he shall put a covering upon his upper lid, and shall cry, Unclean, four to six, all the days wherein the plague shall be in him, it shall be defiled. It was unclean, it was, un it was defiled. That's what the uh, lepers said, uh, were. He is unclean, he shall dwell alone without the camp. Outside the camp shall his habitation be. That's why those lepers, when they were coming from Samaria and from Galilee, that's why they were outside. And that's why they were united together outside. In the rain, they were outside. Sunshine.
were outside cloudy they were outside dark they were outside light they were outside because that's the place for the lepers we are looking at numbers chapter 5 in numbers chapter 5 i'm reading verses 2 and 3 numbers chapter 5 verses 2 and 3 it tells us in verse 2 of Numbers chapter 5, command the children of Israel that they put out of the camp every leper. They put out of the camp every leper, a man, a woman, a leper, outside. A boy, a girl, a leper, outside. Civilized and um, educated, but a leper, outside. And uh, the fellow is having money or is not having money, a leper outside. That was what they did to all the lepers. Everyone that has an issue and whosoever is defiled by the dead body. Look at verse 3. Both male and female shall be put out without the camp. Outside the camp shall ye put them. They that they defile not their camps in the midst whereof I dwell. The reason is that they will not contaminate. They will not defile. They will not uh, corrupt the rest of the congregation. Actually, that's the situation for the sinner. A leper is uh, an outcast. A sinner is an outcast. A leper is defiled. A sinner is defiled. A leper is corrupt. A sinner is corrupt. A leper is separated from the congregation of the covenant people and the sinner is separated from the covenant of the people of God. We're looking at Psalm 1 verse 5. Psalm 1, we're reading from verse 5. In Psalm 1 verse 5, Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor the sinners in the congregation of the righteous congregation of the righteous actually when we have a public service everybody mixes together but you know the time is coming when the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise and we which are alive will be caught up together with them in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord it's going to be a great congregation of saved people a great congregation of righteous people. A great con a congregation of converted people. But sinners will not have part in that rapture. Sinners will not have part in that great congregation in heaven. If any sinner is going to be a part of the raptured people, righteous people, kingdom of God, there must be cleansing today. There must be righteousness today. There must be the grace of God flowing into your life today because it says sinners shall not be in the congregation of the righteous. If they're not there, if they're not in heaven, where will they be? That's why the leader ought to think, your wife, where will she be if she's not born again? Your husband, where will he be if he's not born again? And your children, your son, your daughter, where will they be if they're not born again? Your neighbors, where are they? Where are they? Where is Abel, thy brother? Where art thou yourself? And where is Sarah, thy wife? And where you see that man that helped you on the street at the well, where are they? You must make sure that they have their salvation we're talking about. That's the reason you're a worker. That's the reason you're a leader. So that all these people that are outside the Lord will use you. You'll bring them in in Jesus' name. Amen. Give me a good amen over there. In Matthew chapter 25, Matthew chapter 25, I'm reading from verse 41. It says, Then shall ye say, in verse 41, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That's what happens to those who are spiritual lepers, outcasts until they die. Lepers until they die, lost people until they die, defiled people until they die, corrupt people until they die. But thank God, these lepers, they cried out. They cried out. They said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And thank God, Jesus rejects no one. 
he will not reject you. He will not reject our people. And as we go out and we're reaching out and we're touching their lives and talking to them, the Lord will not reject them in Jesus' name. Let's come back to this Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. And I'm reading now from verse 14. When he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priests. You see what Jesus did here? He actually transferred, he transmitted that healing virtue unto them. But you see, there was no touch. And there was no contact. He didn't send them to River Jordan to go and wash in River Jordan. It was a new day. It was a new deliverance. It was a new method. It was a new approach. All he did was to speak the word. He gave a command. And when the Lord gives you a command and you follow that command, a miracle will happen in your life. And then, look at all of them, without exception, they were united in their prayer. They were united in their supplication. They were united in their demand. They were united in their asking for mercy. They were united in their expectation. But you see, they asked no question. When he said, go show yourself to the priest, they didn't ask any question, no question. They didn't have any lingering. They were not lingering and slowing down and dragging their feet. You know why? Because they believed the Lord. Because they wanted to obey the Lord. Because they knew that since the Lord spoke the word, once there's no question, once there's no lingering, once there's no doubting, once there's no debate, and all they did was just to obey the Lord. That was the expression of their faith. And as you express your faith and you obey the Lord, you'll do wonders in your life and ministry in Jesus' name. I tell you what Jesus did there. That's what he has always done. He speaks the word and the power will follow the word. Matthew chapter 8, we're looking at verse 8. Matthew chapter 8, we're reading from verse 8. In Matthew chapter 8 verse 8, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. Speak the word only. That's what, the, that's what he did to them. Speak the word only. As the word comes into your life, it will do wonders in your life. It will turn your life around. It will change your circumstances. It will change your situation. Speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. As you hear the word of God tonight and you receive it as the word of God, it will work mightily in your life. Work effectually in your life. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 13. It says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, you see that the proclamation comes to you, just receive, no question, no doubt, no lingering, obedience to the word, the expression of your faith. It says, when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth. The word of God. See what it does? You receive it as the word of God, coming directly from the mouth of God, coming directly from the heavenly source. Then it says what you to do in your life. It says which worketh effectually in you that believe. Tonight is that night. Walking effectually in you. I said walking effectually in you. And walking authoritatively in your life in Jesus name. Point number two now. The gratitude of a native Samaritan. The gratitude of a native Samaritan. We're coming back to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. 
And here we're reading from verse 14. And when he saw, when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass, as they went in obedience to what he had said, they were cleansed. They were cleansed. I will be cleansed. They were killed. I'll be killed. They were healed. I'll be healed. They were set free. I'll be free tonight. It says they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back. And with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. Notice this single man, this one man, a Samaritan, native Samaritan. Look at his gratitude. Look at his thankfulness. Number one, with a loud voice. Loud voice. Look at that verse 15. And one of them, when he saw that was sealed, he turned back and with a loud voice, he glorified the Lord. You know what he did? He made himself loud that others will hear. He said, I will not hide this. I'll not be a secret disciple, a secret convert, a secret, uh, a secret person, beneficiary. And with a loud voice, publicly, he glorified the Lord. That's what God expects in your office. That's what he expects in your neighborhood. That's what he expects if you have received the grace of God. Make it public. The cleansing, make it public. The conversion, make it public. You have received the commission. He makes you a pastor, make it public. You have received the commission to be a worker, to be a leader, and to be an evangelist, and to reach out to people that are perishing. It's not just a secret deal. He has called you, make it public. And then it might be during the morning cry. Make it public and with a loud voice. You're telling them about the Lord Jesus Christ. It might be during the lunch hour fellowship. That you make it public. I'm a Christian. I follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you are telling other people. He did this for me. He can do it for you too. It was a public thing with a loud voice. Notice number two here. He glorified God. We're looking at that in verse 15. He turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. He glorified God. You see, he came back. The other people were still going. Thank God I'm cleansed. Thank God I'm made whole. And they were going to show themselves to the priest. But this man exalted Christ above the priest. He said, now that I'm cleansed, Christ must know this false, that the word came with power into my life. Christ must know this false, that I'm a recipient of the grace of God, of the cleansing of God. He made each his priority, going back to the Lord. He made each his priority. Before I see my family, I need to go back to the Lord and thank him. Before I see those praise, I need to go back to the Lord and thank him. That's what the Lord wants in your life. That you give him the priority. You make him number one in your life. That you must speak to him. You must tell him what he has done in your life. Number three, look at verse, uh, verse 16. And he fell down on his face. He fell down on his face. Remember, this was not in a secret place. Remember, this was not in a home, in a house. It was in the public. And this man, number three, fell down at his feet. It was his humility in the public. Humility in the public. You see, if you are a child of God, he that exalted himself shall be abased. He that humbles himself shall be exalted. 
Humility is one of the evidences that the grace of God has touched our lives. Humility is one of the evidences that we know him, we're connected with him, and we're grateful to him that were it not for his sake, we would not have had what we have got. Humility fell down at his feet. Number four, he was a Samaritan. He was a Samaritan. You know what? Those Jewish people, they ridiculed the Samaritans. They reproached the Samaritans. They belittled the Samaritans. They looked down on the Samaritans. But they said, that does not bother me. I'm not ashamed of Jewish ridicule. You know, if you come to know the Lord, if you're a real child of God, if you have been commissioned by the Lord, if the Lord has touched you, if the Lord has anointed you, if the Lord has empowered you, if the Lord has called you that this is what you are to do, you're not going to hold that in a napkin. And you're not going to be ashamed of the Lord. In fact, you see what the Lord has said about those who are ashamed of him. We're looking in at Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 38. It says, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father or the holy angels. Has he called you to be a pastor? Are you ashamed? He's called you to be a preacher. Are you ashamed? It's called you to be a soul winner. Are you ashamed? It's called you to declare the grace of God, the goodness of God unto your neighborhood. Are you ashamed? This man was not ashamed, even though he was a Samaritan. You'll not be ashamed. I will not be ashamed. I can't hear my people. I will not be ashamed. You'll not be ashamed of the Lord in Jesus' name. Romans chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 16. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed. Somebody, can you shout that out? For I am not ashamed. I can't hear you. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Preach that gospel. Don't be ashamed. Believe that gospel. Don't be ashamed. Spread that gospel. Don't be ashamed. Teach that gospel. Don't be ashamed influence the lives of people around you everyone you know with that gospel the good news of the lord for i am not ashamed of the gospel of christ for it is the power of god unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the jew first and also to the greek we're coming back to luke chapter 17 in Luke chapter 17, reading from verse 17, and Jesus answering said, Where were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? Then he goes on to say, There are not found that return to give glory to God except save this stranger. You know what? He was independent. All those, uh, all those ten lepers had been together before. They took every decision together. They ate together. They walked together. They stayed together. They decided everything together. But now, it's been cleansed. Now, his life had changed. Now, a turning point had come in his life. And he decided, I must give glory to God. And the other people, the other nine, they said, no, we're going to show ourselves to the priest. And then we miss our family for a long time. We're going to go to our families. That's the priority now. And we're going to go to those places of pleasure and enjoyment. That's the priority now. He made himself independent. If you really know the Lord, if you know what the Lord has done for you, if you have a grateful heart, a happy heart, a happy soul, and say, see what the Lord has done for me, you will make yourself independent of the past associates in your life. You'll not say, we've been together before, but now you've made your choice. You've made up your mind. And because you've made your choice, you become independent of your past associates. I pray you'll make a right choice. I said you'll make the right choice. 
We're looking at uh, Psalm 119, verse 30. Psalm 119, we're looking at verse 30. It says, I have chosen the way of truth. Make that your choice. This person, I have chosen the way of truth. Be independent of all the opinions around you. I have chosen the way of truth. Whatever the people say, however the people may act, whatever the ridicule they may heap upon you, and whatever persecution, when I say persecution, that's just the little opposition there, little criticism there, don't mind all that. You say, I've made up my mind, I will be independent of these people that do not have gratitude before the Lord. I have chosen the way of truth, that judgment survive before me. I pray that that independent attitude the Lord will grant you to have the courage to do it. We're looking at Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, and I'm reading from verse 42. Luke chapter 10, verse 42. But one thing is needful. This man realized there's one thing, one priority now. There's one thing, one destiny now. There's one thing, one goal now. There's one thing, one assignment now. There's one thing, one responsibility now. There's one thing, one duty now. And I chose that. Although the other nine people may not choose that, that's nothing to me. I've made up my mind, but one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that, that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. And your decision to glorify the Lord, your decision to work for the Lord, your decision to serve the Lord, your decision to be a soul winner. You have chosen that. It will not be taken away from you in Jesus' name. And then we come back to this Luke chapter 17. And I'm reading now from verse 18. It says, There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger and then in verse 19 he said unto him arise go thy way arise go thy way thy faith has made thee whole go thy way in obedience to the Lord go thy way go tell everybody around you go thy way go to your family tell your family members who has done this for you and I pray you'll be a good witness in Jesus' name. I said you'll be a good witness in Jesus' name. See, the word of God is coming to you as a leader. Go out and get the work done. Arise. Don't just sit down there. Arise. And don't just fold your hand. Arise. Don't close your eyes and close your mouth. Arise. And preach the word of God. And as you preach that word, many souls will come to know the Lord in Jesus' name. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 26. Acts chapter 8, reading from verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goes down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is the desert. And what did he do? Verse 27, he arose and went. He obeyed. Jesus told that clay leper, arise, go thy way. And he went also and is telling you today, arise, you'll arise. Go and preach, you'll go and preach. Declare the truth of the Lord, you'll declare that truth convincingly and without any shame in Jesus' name. Chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 6. Acts chapter 9, verse 6. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be sure, told thee what thou must do. That's Paul the Apostle, and from the time he began to do what had been shown unto him, what he has been told, he never stopped. And from the time you start serving the Lord, winning souls, talking to people, sharing the gospel, preaching the good news of the kingdom, you'll never stop in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 17, 
I'm reading from verse 19. He said unto him, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. Confirmation from Christ. Thy faith has made thee whole. Tonight, your faith will make you whole. Mark chapter 10, verse 52. Mark chapter 10, verse 52. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. Any amen in that corner there? Yeah. Thy faith will make you whole. Yeah. Completely whole. Yeah. Totally whole. Yeah. Completely set free. Yeah. And every bondage will be broken away from your life in Jesus' name. Yeah. And immediately you receive the sight and you follow Jesus in the way. He followed Jesus in the way. Go and spread the good news. Go and tell them of the goodness of the Lord. Go and show what he has done for you. Romans chapter 1 verse 8. Romans chapter 1 verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Your faith is spoken of throughout the the whole world, in your world, in your community, share this faith, share this understanding, tell of what Christ has done, he has saved you, tell them, he has sanctified you, tell them, he has immersed you and did you the Holy Ghost, empowered you by the Holy Ghost, tell them. He has given you the good news to go and share with the people. Tell them and let this faith in the Lord Jesus Christ be spoken about in all your communities, in all your cities, and in all your areas. And I pray you'll be an effective witness of the Lord in Jesus' name. Back to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. Point number one, the graciousness of a noble Savior. Point number two, the gratitude of a native Samaritan. Point number three now, the guilt of nine silent superiors. The guilt of nine silent superiors. We're coming to chapter 17. Verses 17 and 18. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God. Save this stranger. The Lord wondered about the others. And these others should have known better. Because this man that came back to give glory to God was only Samaritan. All the others were Jews and he claimed to be superior to the Samaritan. And yet it was the Samaritan that did the right thing. These nine were guilty. They were silent superiors. Yet where are they? Silent speakers. That surprises you. How can somebody be a speaker and be silent? Don't you know, when they came to Jesus Christ, the first time, they lifted up their voice. They were speakers. They knew the language. They knew what to say. But they were silent. Where are the nine silent speakers? These were silent shouters. They could shout when the leprosy was there. They could shout when they had the problem. They could shout in prayer and supplication. But now that they got what they wanted, instead of speaking out, instead of shouting his praise, instead of shouting their testimony, instead of shouting the witness, they were silent shouters. These were silent suppliants. Suppliants are the people that make supplication. They are begging, they are pleading, they are beseeching. They are saying, please, please. They knew how to supplicate suppliants, but now there were silent suppliants, and the Lord is saying, 
Where are they? Where are they? Where are they? And the Lord is asking you, where are you there? If you knew how to pray, and now it's blessed you, it's converted you, it's commissioned you, it's done something in your life, it's done something for you, and now you are silent. These were silent survivors. They survived. You know, that disease of leprosy, it will be cutting up their fingers, cutting up their toes, cutting up their leaves, cutting up their eyelids, eventually cutting, cutting, cutting. They were getting nearer and nearer death. But now the power of God came upon them. They survived. They survived. But these were silent survivors. Look at what the Lord has done for you many years gone by. Where would you be if the Lord had not uh, had mercy on you? You survived. You succeeded. And here you are today. He has given you a work to do. And the Lord is saying, where are they? Where are they? Those nine silent survivors. Silent stars. Silent stars. You understand? These people that were cleansed of their leprosy, they became like stars. Why? Because for 400 years, there was no voice of a prophet in the land of Israel. And even before that, hundreds of years, thousands of years, uh, you don't find any of these lepers being cleansed. From the time since the time of Naaman, thousands of years have passed. But now, these people that God did this mighty thing for, and they became like real stars, silent stars, where are they? If the Lord has brought the light in your life, gospel in your life, that makes you to shine in your family, the only believer, in your place of work, the only believer, in your community, the shining stars that know the word of God and the light of the gospel shall be coming out through you, but you are silent. These were the silent sons of Abraham. Silent sons of Abraham. Sons of Abraham. That's what they claimed. Jews, that's what they claimed. Special privilege, that's what they claimed. But they were silent. And the Lord was so surprised. He said, where are the nine? Why are they not showing gratitude? Nine out of ten. Not showing gratitude. Nine members in the church out of ten. Look at our church. Look at those who claim to be members. And look at the people that come, 9 out of 10. That's 90 out of 100. That's 900 out of 1,000. Not showing gratitude. They just sit down there. They come for Bible study. They come for workers meeting. But 9 out of 10, 90 out of 100, 900 out of 1,000, there they are, silent. And the Lord is wondering why. Nine workers out of ten that are really going out and they're telling the story of the crucified Christ. Nine workers out of ten. I'm a worker, I'm a worker. How many of us workers are productive? How many of us are doing the work every day? And the Lord is saying, where are those nine workers? Only one out of ten. Only 10 out of 100, only 100 out of 1,000 are the people doing the work. Where are the other 9? Where are the other 90? Where are the other 900 out of 1,000? 9 people out of 10. Now, nine beneficiaries out of ten beneficiaries who have come. The Lord has revived us. The Lord has taught us. And the Lord has raised us up. And he's saying, where are the other nine? Where are the other nine? Nine fathers out of ten. There are fathers. They know the word of God. But they are not teaching their children. Nine fathers out of ten they're negligent. They're not getting this gospel according to their children. Nine mothers out of ten. Actually making the salvation of their children, of their sons, of their daughters, the priority in their lives. Nine out of ten. And the Lord is saying, but why? What are we to do about that? If you know them, what are you to do? The people who should be coming out and proclaiming the word. The people who should be coming out and declaring that Jesus is Savior. 
What do you do? Where are the nine? Search for them. Search for them. Then the church. Then the church. They are members of the church. They are part of the nine that the Lord is asking. Where are they? Search for them. Fathers who are not training their children. You see their children. Search for their fathers. Where are the nine? Mothers who are not bringing up their daughters. And you see the lives of their daughters. Search for them. Where are the nine? Preachers. Preachers. Preachers who are not preaching. Overseers who are not overseeing. Leaders who are not leading the people that should be teaching the word of God convincingly they have the word, but nine out of ten, how are they doing it? Search for them, and it says, As a search for them, seek them out, seek them out, seek them out. Nine out of ten, around us, there it says, The word of God says, When you get them, enlighten them. Jesus has been looking for you. Where are the nine? Jesus has been wondering about you. Walker, where are the nine? Jesus has been wondering about you. Leader, where are the nine? Enlighten them what you should have done. You should have come back to Jesus. What you should have done. You should have lifted up your voice. What you should have done. You should have glorified God. What you should have done. Enlighten them. Enlist them. Enlist them. Where are the nine? Search them out. Seek them out. Enlighten them. Then enlist them. And say, no, you will not be silent anymore. You're superior to many people on the field. You are a star above many people on the field. You have had the word of God. You know the word of God. You know the doctrine. More than many people who are there on the field. Enlighten them. Enlist them. Engage them. Engage them. And say, we'll do it together. We'll witness together. We'll preach together. We'll grow the church together. We'll multiply the church together. We'll plant the church together. The Lord has been asking of you, what are you doing? Why are you silent? Why are you folding your hand? Why are you keeping quiet? Why are you sitting down? Why are you just eating and eating and eating and you are not walking? Why are you taking in and you are not giving out? Why are you so selfish? Why are you so self-centered? Why are you so self-interested? Why are you so self-indulgent? Why is it you're only thinking about yourself? I want, I want, I want. Give me, give me, give me. Give it out, give it out. Engage them. Not only that, and treat them. Plead with them. Plead with them earnestly. You are born again. You are born to reproduce. You are a child of God. Help other people. Teach other people. Direct other people. And treat them. Envision them. Envision them. Those who do not have any vision, where there's no vision, the people all perish. But show them what they can do. Show them where they can do it. And enlighten them. Envision them. Enlist them. Engage them. And treat them. You must not remain like this. Don't you know where those nine silent survivors, nine silent superiors, nine silent shouters, nine silent speakers, nine silent sons of Abraham, and nine seniors, where they are, they are silent. Go search them out. The Lord is asking today, where are the nine? Go to them. Convince them. Compel them. Hold their hand. Make them to come to Christ afresh. And commit themselves to this great work. And we will glorify the Lord together. I said we will glorify the Lord together. But that grace is not ready. We will glorify the Lord together. You will be available. I said you'll be available. I said you'll be available. We're looking at Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15 verses 5 and 6. Romans chapter 15 verses 5 and 6. Now, the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another in or to Christ Jesus that we 
that ye may with one mind and one mouth, what are we going to do? Glorify God. One mind, we have the same mind. We have the same heart. We have the same spirit. We have the same goal. With one mind and one mouth, glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Will you do it? I said, will you do it? I can't hear but that great people. Will you do it? Rise up and tell the Lord, yes, Lord, I will. Yes, Lord, I will. Yes, Lord, I will. Yes, Lord, I will. Where are the, where are the other nine? Where are the nine? Where are the nine? Where are the nine? The nine superior ones, where are you? You must open your mouth. You must pray. You must tell the Lord, Lord, I'm now available. Are you one of those nine walkers? Nine walkers, a walker, not walking. Are you one of those nine leaders, a leader, not leading? Are you one of those nine sons and daughters? You have the commission, you have the commandment, but you are not carrying it out. Are you one of those uh, nine members? The Lord has brought his grace into your life, and you are not showing that grace unto other people.